something happens and one of those three goes out, we'll just ferry this one back and forth. Um, all right, well, good evening. Um, tonight, we want to kind of follow up on what we talked about in church this morning. Um, for those of you who weren't um, here, um, I preached this morning about um, the issue of abortion. I, I talked about a lot of the justifications that are given for it and kind of gave a biblical answer and kind of answered that with the gospel following up and then briefly mentioned how churches and individuals can um, get involved in um, working with that issue um, with women and with the unborn. And so tonight we um, have brought in four um, people who have experience doing that. I want to kind of hear some practical ways to, to really put flesh to the bones of the things that I mentioned this morning um, and maybe even add to what, what I said. Um, so let me introduce the panelist. Um, first, we have uh, Christy Gilley. Uh, she is the advocacy director for CASA. She is also a former foster parent and has adopted two children. Um, then we have Laura Maxwell, director of Called to Care. She's also a past foster parent. Um, Jennifer Metzger, um, director of the Tipton Pregnancy Care Center. And then many of you know Matt Strevel, pastor of the Road Church Plant in Tipton. Um, he's a former foster parent. He's adopted. He's also a former board member for the Pregnancy Care Center, or are you still currently? I'm not sure. Former. Former, okay. Um, and so this is the panel we're going to be talking with. Um, so um, recapping from what I said this morning as a way to um, the, the, the God has woven babies together in the womb. And, and so it's a great um, sin when abortion is done. But Jesus came to redeem that and to save those who um, would even participate in that sin. And so now we as the redeemed people of God move forward in um, serving women and children within that as well as um, it calling out the darkness and exposing it and um, bringing light to the circumstances. Um, and so in light of that, um, in light of the sermon this morning, I wanted you here so we could talk very practical ways that we could do that kind of thing. Um, as I told the church this morning, no baby is saved um, simply by us being pro-life in our heart. Uh, there's got to be something more. Um, and so I'm just going to ask some questions and y'all just kind of bounce off of each other and talk and, and answer these and let's have a conversation. We'll go till seven, and, and once seven arrives, we'll wrap up and be finished. Um, so first of all, I just want to kind of hear, so, so Roe versus Wade was overturned June the 24th um, by the Supreme Court. Um, that, for, for those of you who weren't here this morning, that, that, what that means is not that abortion is completely done away with. It means that now each individual state gets to make their own choice about what laws of abortion there are in their state. So Kentucky has completely outlawed abortion. California is ramping up to make it even more accessible. Um, and so um, how did you react when, when you heard that Roe versus Wade was overturned? Let's just start there. I'll go first. <laughs> um, you know, when I started this ministry in 2016, it wasn't a matter of if, it was when. I knew that. And so God had already, you know, started preparing my heart and how we needed to move the center forward for a post-Roe v. Wade world. But the day it happened, it was so just, wow. <laughs> I was sitting there. It was a Friday morning, and I was still having my coffee. And um, Darlene Barber, who was the director before me, she texted me. She was like, Roe v. Wade's been overturned. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and so I pull up the news, and I'm like, okay. And the only thing I knew to do was go to the office, you know. So we went to the office, and it was just a very surreal day. You know, it's like, okay, it's here. What's next? And so, you know, we have struggled a little bit with, the idea of Roe v. Wade being overturned because we knew that we have such a short window of time to meet these women, to get them to choose a life-affirming decision. And so for us, it's like we knew it would take our window even shorter. And so we knew that it was going to be a call for the church to step up and minister to these women and disciple them and just to really, like you said, take it a step beyond pro-life and, you know, be pro-woman as well. And so it has been a whirlwind <laughs> since we've had so many people just reaching out, like, how can we help? And so, um, Matt, you prob I'd like to know kind of how you felt with, you know, the news as well. So. Well, I, I, I really um, I feel much, uh, strangely much different than I expected I would. Um, and I don't, I don't even know if I can make sense of that. But I, I, uh, when I was a teenager, I started a, a Teens for Life in Rockdale County when I grew up. So... I've been kind of involved in this for a long, 
long time and, and consider Roe v. Wade, abortion as a, a fact and a reality, an incredible evil in, in the world. Um, so on the one hand, the overturn of Roe versus Wade, I, I, I'm incredibly thankful for. Um, I think that's an incredible blessing. Um, but at the same time, uh, just you, you look at the fallout in our nation because of it. We're, you know, our world is no less fallen. Um, there's no less wickedness or evil the day after, the day before. Maybe it will be restrained somewhat in some places, but it highlights to me the fact of the great, great need, the work for pregnancy care centers, adoption, fostering. But more than just that, the gospel. I mean, to me, the only thing that's going to transform the lives of so many millions upon millions of our neighbors, friends, relatives who are not pro-life is going to be the gospel. So, so the great joy, but also a great degree of ongoing concern. Yeah, I would say... Um I'm somewhere you know, where you guys were too. Of course, um, being pro-life, I was very happy about the decision, but with that joy almost come this instant overwhelming feeling of how it was gonna change the work we do. Um, we're working with foster and adoptive families and advocating for children who are already waiting for families. And um, so I took some time to look and um, in our state alone last year, there were 32,000 ado um, ado adoptions, I wish, <laughs> abortions. And, um, and I thought, you know, a lot of the media is saying that these children will end up in foster care, be adopted, but we know that's not really true. I mean, not every child who was go is going to be born now because of these laws is going to go into foster care, be put up for adoption. But I thought, what if even like 10% with a system that is like so overran already? Um, we already have close to 4,000 children waiting to be adopted in our state. So what if we added to that? Um, we already have almost 12,000 children in foster to care, and that number has been climbing post-COVID pretty significant. Um, what would that look like? There's literally not enough resources. Um, there's not enough money or people to care for these children or their families. There's not already. Um, and so I was really, obviously, like I said, glad that it happened but at the same time overwhelmed by the work that we're already doing that the Bible says will never end. <laughs> and just thinking about adding to that. Um, so that was like this high and then a low. And then, and then I talked to my staff and we're like, all right, but God knows this is going to happen, so now what? So then it came this high again as we started literally <laughs> on the laptop sitting at the round table. What, how can we respond if somebody calls us we didn't know if anybody would, but like you said, I mean, churches have been calling just like you guys and saying, I guess we better put our money where our mouth is, put our feet where our mouth is. What can we do now? Um, and so it's created this great opportunity just like this tonight to bring the reality of what's going on in our communities to light and to give some very practical ways that people engage at all levels. Um, I know before you leave tonight, I hope everybody feels like they can do something tomorrow. <laughs> Um, because we're going to give you some practical ideas, I hope, um, if not long-term, to really impact these families and their children. Um, um, I was actually, I had just pulled up to a McDonald's in Tipton and was about to um, go in and observe a visit between a mom and her children who were in care and also try to basically beg the mom to get the help that she needed so that she could get her children back. And um, when I saw that, and, and I confess, I do not look at the news a lot, so I really didn't. I mean, I kind of knew that there was talk about it, but there's been talk about it for a while. But when I saw it, I was just like, whoa, that really happened. Wow. I was very shocked, but of course, happy. And then, you know, like, these others, I also got very overwhelmed, like, oh, okay, because at the time, I really didn't understand what that meant. I thought, I didn't know, did that mean it's now illegal everywhere? I didn't know until I dug into it a little more. Um, 
I wish that it was, but um, I know it, it's going to, op- it has opened up and will open up a whole host of other things that we're going to have to deal with, and that's great. I'm glad that that's happened, but we need help. <laughs> when it, like Laura said, we're already struggling, and, you know, that eventually when things, when we figure out what's going on, I know Jennifer and I were talking earlier that we don't know exactly what that means for Georgia. There's a lot of things still up in the air, um, just trying to figure all that out. And I know the Lord will provide for all of these things, and, you know, anyone who helps will be blessed, of course. Yeah, it sounds like we're all kind of in the same place of, like, when I heard about it, I was like, oh, awesome. Wait, buckle up, brace for impact. Like, you know, um, what, what's going to come about from that? Um, so in light of that, like, like of course, Roe versus Wade being overturned is a, is a good thing, but it does not change circumstances. It does not change that women are still going to not want their children. And so um, I've never personally known anyone who's had an unwanted pregnancy. Um, I don't know if the same would be true for everybody here, but... Um, so kind of tell us what goes through a woman's head when she turns up pregnant and doesn't want to be. I mean, obviously, she doesn't, like, on the surface level, she doesn't want to be. What's going on in her mind and her heart? I'll, I'll take this one. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you looking at me? <laughs> yeah, so, oh, my goodness. I'll just kind of play out a couple of scenarios of things we've seen. Um, a lot of times. It interferes with plans. Um, for example, we have had a patient come through who she was from out of town here on a scholarship. She didn't know how it would affect her scholarship. And then, unfortunately, we live in a time where guys are too scared to stand up, you know, and say, I'll support you. You know, they, have, they feel like they have to say, it's your right, it's your choice. And a lot of times, she's just wanting them to say, I've got you, you know. So that's playing through her head because we often see, you know, she will bring the father of the baby with her. And that is a much need for male advocacy because many times they're sitting in there in that room while she's getting the services. And, you know, all they know to say is, it's your decision. And so we really want to equip men to have more spiritual backbone. So that is a need. Just go ahead and throw that out there. (laughs) um, So, yeah, a lot of times she's like, how am I going to finish school? You know, how am I going to tell my parents? Um, yes, we do see hard situations sometimes with teen pregnancy where they're threatened to be thrown out of their house, um, things like that. And so, but a lot of times they just don't know how that it's going to play in with their plans that they've made. So that's, you know, that's where we can come in and say, okay, here are your resources. Um, did you know this is available? And this is how we partner together with other ministries to make sure that she knows she has a village. I always use that. I know it's cliche. It takes a village, but it truly does. I know for me, I grew up in church. I went through an unexpected pregnancy um, when I was 21, and I was terrified. Abortion was never an option for me because I grew up knowing that I could never do that. I knew it was wrong, but unfortunately, because it has been legal, we sit in front of people all the time who, you know, they they grew up in church, and they think, well, it's legal. They justify it. Um, you know, we had a situation a few weeks ago, this girl, she grew up in church and, you know, she said, can I find my way back to God? And we're like, yes, he's a forgiving God. There's grace, but there's repercussions for the decisions we make. And so bringing that truth and love is difficult. Um, what we really want to do is slow them down so that they can make a decision that's not in fear. Um, and so that's the beauty of what we do is like, hey, let's slow down. Let's talk through each scenario, adoption, parenting, abortion. What does that look like for your life? And so it goes spiritual pretty quick because you often see they don't believe in it. They just don't feel like they have a choice. Yeah, I was going to say a lot of the um, families we work working with, family, especially when we work with family preservation, which are families that are at risk of losing their children, um, in the cases where the moms are pregnant, they'll talk about possibly aborting this baby because the obvious, they're already at risk of losing the ones they have uh, because they can't care for them. Um, most of the time, they, um, many of these children, these adults were also at care at some point in their life. Um, there's rarely a father in the home and um, they're really struggling. So we see finances as being a big reason. I think there's seven major reasons that women choose abortion but finances is one of them, um, one of the big ones, because they cannot care for the children they already have, um, don't have daycare, 
um, don't have anybody they trust to watch their kids if they could get a job. Their jobs threaten to let them go, even though that's not supposed to happen if they are pregnant again. And so we see that being um, a big reason um, that women choose it, that we work with the most. Um, and then with some of our younger pregnant people that we work with, they're mostly teens. Um, some of those babies are from incest, from being abused by their fathers or their brothers. And so we see that too. Um, they don't want to have the baby. They're very scared. And um, obviously that's very traumatizing what they've been through to be sexually assaulted by a family member. And um, they have a lot of fears that we hear that things possibly being wrong with the baby because of incest and things like that. Um, not saying that never happens, but it's not as, it's not a guarantee that the children's going to have a lot of problems, you know, like maybe people would think or whatever. Um, so those are the two things we hear the most from moms that are considering it. Yeah, so um, that's what makes this such a complicated issue because if it was simply like the the stereotype is that it's all just people who just want to, you know, just evil people who want to kill babies. And like there certainly are those. We, we see broadcast of them on the news and everything. But I mean, it doesn't make it right. But, but you got to understand all the situations that go into it and really meet them with the love of Jesus where they're at um, and, and help them. Uh, you know, Scripture says, um, you know, help them escape out of that, you know, sinful snare that they're in. Um, so this morning when, when I was closing my sermon, I gave three action steps um, in, in light of what we had talked about. So I want to talk through those three with you. So the first thing I said is um, what we have to do is we have to repent of our indifference. Um, that, that's the first step. So what are some ways we must repent of our indifference toward the issue of abortion? Just, just pretend you're speaking to me. You're not going to offend me. I'm, I know I'm a <laughs> sinner, so go for it. I'm used to stepping on toes, so, um, you know something, I mean, uh, what, what would you think towards someone who is indifferent to the Jewish Holocaust, and, you know, how many more millions of babies have been killed, ripped apart in their mother's womb, in what ought to be the safest place in America, so... It's kind of like we've just become so desensitized. Even the people who are pro-life, th these are statistics at this point to us. And I think f the failure to see and value, like subtly here, even I'm listening to this, I'm listening to Laura talk, and I'm thinking, man, these really poor mothers who are going to be bringing babies into the world without fathers present. You know, is there going to be more crime? Is there going to, are these going to be, you know, model citizens when they turn out and and the failure to value every human life as a unique person created in the image of God for the glory of God. Abortion is nothing less than a, an assault on God and his image. And so, you know, just, I know we're, as believers, if you're pro-life sitting here tonight, you probably hadn't said, well, let's be indifferent to abortion, but just over time, we've become callous to it, and, and a lot of us are in our own little little bubbles where we may not be exposed to these types of situations like, like Laura and Jennifer see. So I think just becoming aware. What's, what, 63 million babies aborted in the U.S.? since Roe, you know, was passed as law. Just to throw this in, Matt, um, when we say 63 million, that doesn't even include the abortion pill. 54% um, of abortions mm. are, are medical, which means a woman can take a pill that causes her to, pass, to have that baby, to abort that baby. And so those aren't even included in those numbers. Mm. And it just goes back to the root of the problem. It's a heart condition. And so, you know, moving forward, we, we have to remember that. Um, so when we look at those numbers, that doesn't even really speak the full truth and the full magnitude of how many babies are actually aborted. And I think, too, like, I think a lot of our indifference, because people are <laughs> indifferent to this, um, is that our indifference to people, to the moms. You know, because I'm sure when I just threw out a couple of those stories I've said, I'm sure some people would be like, well, why did she get pregnant if she couldn't afford the kids she had? So people are already not caring about the moms. Um, 
and we were just talking about that earlier, like some parts of our work will not change because we love these people no matter what. Like wherever we meet them, we walk with them forward. So whether they choose to abort those children or not, um, or stay in their brokenness, we keep loving them and serving them. So I think overall we need to stop being indifferent to all the sins going on around us and all the brokenness going on around us um, and really love these people like Christ would and, and enter into those situations and serve them, serve them better. Um, just to kind of piggyback off of what you guys said, um, I think the first thing as far as repentance for the church is uh, the church would be the first place that a woman finds, uh, who finds herself in this situation and has these fears, um, the church would be the first place that they want to come for help, and guidance, and love, and, you know, restoration or salvation or whatever, um, whatever they may need. And unfortunately, the church is, as a whole, I'm not saying this church or churches around here, but generally speaking, the church is viewed as judgmental and harsh and you know, demonize these women and the situations that they're in. And I think the most important thing is to uh, repent of not actively showing love to those people. Don't don't worry about whose fault it is or that that's beyond all that's in the past now. Being pregnant is not sinful. Having a baby is not sinful. Um, there are I'm sure Jennifer has come across, I know when I used to volunteer many, 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 many years ago, we won't talk about how long ago, at the um, pregnancy care center, we had a shocking amount of married women come in, and they had two or three children, and they were pregnant with another, and terrified that they literally would not be able to feed the child. I mean, could you imagine having to consider murdering your own child? I hate to use that word, but that's what it is. Because you can't feed them? Because you can't already feed the children you have? You know, and we don't know. Was she in an abusive marriage where she didn't have a choice about what was going on? I mean, we don't know. And and who are we to judge? And so I think that's the first step. First. Uh, Um, and I, think I, was gonna say this, um, I know I went to listen to someone actually um, in my church spoke recently about, or not recently, it's probably been a year ago now, time flies, but about um, that she'd had a couple abortions, a member of our church, when she was younger, and, and revealed that one in four women sitting in church this morning have had an abortion, and that... Um, that that's something that is so, like, embarrassed and shameful. Like, does anybody want to wear a T-shirt with anything they've done on it? No. Um, but that, um, so I just pray for even, like, boldness for, like, like she stood up and talked because it made, if those women in the church, that's, like, I hate to say, like, a un unique sin because it's not. But it's just like when people stand up and say, I struggle with addiction. It makes people struggle with addiction feel like they can come to this church and have somebody to talk to. So I just pray that women in the church might be somebody in this room, and it might have been in 1960, I don't know, but I pray that somebody, these women will stand up and said, I did it, and by God's grace, you know, that I've been restored. Yeah. Because yeah. it's going to take those people. I mean, the Lord, we all go through things. We've all got stories of different things that we've been through, and the Lord helped us get through that, and that makes us be able to do better in our jobs, to connect with people that are with the same struggles. So we're going to need women who know the Lord to stand up and said, say, you know, I did this too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I mentioned today in my sermon, um, stats say 95% of women in the church have never, that have had an abortion, have never dealt with it. Um, and so what power the gospel could have if confession and, and, and you know, healing could happen there. Um, so that's the first step I gave. The second step was, was pray. Um, what, in your line of work, what are some specific ways we must pray for the abortion issue? Take this one. Um, so <clears throat> I was talking with Christy earlier, and as I mentioned, we already have a short window of time that we've been trying to reach these women. And now with 
the political part of this, you know, there's a lot of confusion right now. Has the heartbeat bill passed? All of these things. And so we are trying to better, you know, navigate through because medical services are what she's looking for. She's coming to us to get her pregnancy confirmed, to do an ultrasound, also for decision support and options consultation, but it's that medical services that get her in the door. Well, with the heartbeat bill, if it's passed this month, a woman cannot get an abortion once a heartbeat is detected. So you can see that kind of voids the ultrasound. We already see these women very early in their pregnancy, and so we can't always do an ultrasound to show them the life within their womb. And so we have to be very strategic in how we're reaching these women with medical services and getting them in the door so that we can talk to them. Because they come in looking for one thing and they leave realizing that we've taken a holistic approach so they can think this through spiritually, you know, and how it's going to impact their life. And so that's a huge prayer need. Um, also, something else that Christy mentioned is we're really trying to implement programs for these women to disciple them. Um, a lot of times in church, we think that we are supporting unexpected pregnancy by throwing a lady a baby shower, things like that. But it's always the kindness of God that brings people to repentance. And we recognize that the pregnancy, once it's done, so we don't want to bring further shame onto that woman and her unborn. Um, so we're trying to equip the churches to know how to love on these women and also to disciple them so they don't find themselves in this situation again. They can move forward single parenting, um, know their worth so they don't make the same bad decisions and that they can, you know, continue. Because I know for me, had it not been for my church family, when I had my son, I don't know how I would have made it. They taught me how to navigate through life, how to make responsible decisions. And, and like Matt said, you know, the gospel is what transforms us. And so those are ways that we've got to look forward and say, okay, this, these are practical ways that we can help this issue. Because like I said, it's a hard issue. Um, third action step, and we'll spend the rest of the time tonight on this one specifically, is get involved. Um, and so I mentioned this morning proactive responses and reactive responses, proactive being actually going and doing something, reactive being um, responding when something's thrown into your lap. Um, and so your daughter turns up pregnant or, you know, something like that. Um, what are some, I think when you mentioned earlier, you, you want us to do something tomorrow. So what are some immediate steps we can take this week to get involved? Obviously, things like adoption and fostering take time, but what are some things we can do right now? Um, as individuals first, we'll talk about as a church in a minute, but just as individuals. <laughs> Since I opened my mouth and said that, <laughs> I had something for you tomorrow. <laughs> no, there's so many ways that you can get involved to serve um, with any of our ministry. I know cost is not a ministry, but we consider it a ministry. <laughs> we won't say it out loud so that they can keep getting funding, but they are. <laughs> um, they really are. Um, but there's so many things that you can do just as like an individual person and individual family. And some of those may be um, to even just host a lemonade stand in your yard. Or if you bake, do a bake sale. So basically I'm referring to like fundraising and give those funds to any of our groups. Um, and not just us. There's so many. Tipton is so blessed. Peanut Butter and Jesus. I mean, the list goes on and on. We have so many amazing resources. Um, if you want to donate to Oasis, I mean, any resource that these families need, like I referred to earlier, there are about seven uh, main reasons that people choose abortion, and Tipton is blessed to have most of those resources here in our community, but um, a lot of us do struggle financially just making it and um, I kind of get tickled when I go to Costa's fundraiser or if I go to <laughs> their fundraiser, it's the same 50 people that come to our fundraisers. It's the same people um, who are giving and keeping all of these ministries alive. So if you have any talent or anything that you can do, um, doing something like that would be um, a super practical way to thing to do. Um, also coming out and like touring our facility facilities, just coming and seeing our offices. Um, and just meeting the people we work with, learning more about what we do um, so that you can start volunteering. I mean, there is a little training process and background, so it's not this tomorrow. Um, it might take a week or a month, but just to get you vetted and everything. But um, we're always in need of volunteers and people to serve. But even if you just came and toured the Pregnancy Care Center this week, 
even if just to get the knowledge to go back to your girlfriends over coffee next week, just just to spread the knowledge of what we're doing would be super beneficial. I think it's during these times because this is something we've had to be careful of at the center. When you recognize that these decisions are made and all of a sudden there's a cascade of other things um, that need to happen, you're like, okay, Lord, don't let us get off mission, you know. And so for us, you know, we really encourage people, what is your one thing? What is your gifting? What is your calling? And take that one thing and volunteer one hour, two hours. Just come in, pray, figure out where you fit, tell your story. Educa education is key in everything. Go out and talk, <laughs> you know, build relationships. And, and that's what it takes. You know, it takes partnering with our community. So I think it's just important during these times so that we're not overwhelmed and we don't, you know, end up doing like this like stop pray what is your one thing and roll with that yeah that's good because when when all this started happening and when people were then saying you christians need to get involved now i i kind of had this like freak out moment where i'm like all right i got to do this and this and this and this and this yeah. and in my mind it was like i'm finding my justification before the lord by how much i can do and one person is not going to completely do away with abortion so find something and do it well um yeah. Like you say, that reminds me because sometimes people come into our research center. We had somebody come recently and said, and somebody had dropped off some used car seats, and they need to be cleaned. And she is now the car seat cleaning lady. Like she's a grandma here in town. She's like, I have to do this for my daughter and her children. And so she, every time we get in two or three, we call her. And that may seem like a small thing, but it's not. I mean, to these mothers that we're working with, they don't have safe car seats for their children um, that are already in poverty. This grandma here in town, most y'all probably know her, but. She lovingly washes each piece of this car seat and puts it back together. Um, we have people who knit, who make blankets for the babies when they're born. Um, and so, yeah, what you said, like, whatever you do, um, you can do it for the Lord and, and do it for these families. And uh, the foster mom that might get that car seat is very appreciative, too, <laughs> because she's got 900 million other things she needs to do um, besides clean car seats. Um, uh, there's actually two things. One is the obvious. Um, I work for CASA, so, um, and I love all these ministries. I'm also on the board at Lifehouse Ministries. If you're not, I wish Miss LaRae Moore was here. Um, she, she amazes me. But um, there's just so much you can do. But obviously, I'm going to ask, you know, please consider being a CASA. <laughs> and all you need to do tomorrow is go online to our website, and I have it here, and you start that application, and we'll start that process. We have a training in October. Could you um, tell us what CASA is? Because that's the yes. one of, of the three of you that I don't know what it is. Okay. CASA stands for Court Appointed Special Advocate. And what we do is we um, train volunteers after a background check and all that sort of thing, like Laura was talking about. <laughs> And what we do is we train you to advocate for a child that is already in foster care. And what that looks like in a nutshell, it usually takes, and every situation is different. It depends on how many kids are in the family and that sort of thing. But it generally takes 10 to 15 hours a month, maybe a little more or a little less some months. Um, it's just gathering information. We observe and report to the judge. I mean, we literally... We talk to the parents, the foster parents, of course, the children, um, the therapists, the doctors, the schools, whoever is has any influence in the child or children's lives. Um, we communicate with them. We gather information. We help caseworkers because where our CASAs normally have one case, unless they've been doing it a while and just really gung-ho and want to do two or three cases, some of ours do have. Uh, multiple cases, but whereas we typically have one case, the DFAT's caseworkers have 20, 30, or more, and there's no way. It is humanly impossible to do their job. I mean, I, we even fuss about them sometimes, <laughs> but, you know, they really cannot, you you cannot ask so much out of a human being, so we try to help our, our DFAT's caseworkers and um, the main thing is that you are giving that child a voice in the courtroom because out of all the people in the courtroom, the child's voice is drowned out nine times out of ten. What is in their best interest? Not mamas, not daddies, not foster moms, child's. And 
I have never had a CASA tell me that they don't enjoy the work. Does it get hard? Yes. Is it frustrating? Yes. Very frustrating sometimes. But the rewards, just yesterday I went to, um, a along with one of my volunteers, to visit some children. And I was telling these ladies earlier, I mean, they're in a decent foster home. And I say that because we have really, really good foster homes. We have decent ones, and we have ones that I don't know how they became foster homes. <laughs> but um, this was a decent one. And But the problem is these children were not being shown affection. They literally, they were three and five years old, and they had to stay in their room, which is only where their toys could be, unless they had to use the bathroom or eat or take a bath. And so when I got there in my casa, they were attention starved, you know, and just the three-year-old, I gave him a hug, and normally they hug you and let go, but he just held on and held on, and I picked him up and rubbed his back and put on him, and they both cried and begged us to take him with us when we left, and that so, that, so yes, it's hard. It is very hard sometimes. Um, but these, all these numbers that we're throwing out, are children they are people they are souls um not just the children of course the parents um but that is one thing um, that you could do tomorrow <laughs> we have a train we train twice a year spring and fall and we have one starting in um october or if you just are curious about it and want to know um we have people that volunteer who work full-time we have retired people we have stay-at-home moms we have all sorts of um we have doctors we have teachers i mean anybody can do it literally anybody can do it um you don't have to have a college degree you don't have to have you just have to care that's all you gotta do we'll take care of the rest um but the other thing i wanted to say was just open your eyes start small when you go out in public when you go to the grocery store when you go to walmart just pay attention to what's going on around you i know Y'all could probably say this too. Since I've been in this fostering world for several years now, it's totally changed my view of my world around me. I'm that person that just kind of have tunnel vision, and if I got to go in Walmart and get paper towels, and I'm just going and getting them and leave. But now I see, and every time I hear a baby cry in Walmart, or you know, I'm like, what? The? <laughs> you know, not not being in people's business, or but like, how can I help? Is this mama having a bad day? Can I just go up to her and say, do you need some help? Do you need me to hold your baby while you do this or that? I mean, there's just so many different things, but just open your eyes and maybe grab a extra pack of diapers off the shelf and take it to call to care or Lifehouse. And, I mean, there's just so many, many. We could literally sit here all night <laughs> and talk about yeah. Um, want to jump to fostering and adoption in a minute, but first, what are some ways, and maybe this wouldn't be any different, what are some ways churches can, can, can get involved in serving in this, in this area? Maybe we'll start with Matt since you're a pastor. Well, there's, there's lots of different ways, and, and I want to maybe tie this together with the individual and maybe the church. I'm sitting here listening and thinking, there's a prayer that I've often prayed uh, as an individual, uh, thinking about evangelism, because you know I'm always thinking about souls and wanting to see people come to Christ. And so, one prayer that I've prayed frequently, not as much as I wish I had, but I just pray. It's very simple. Lord, would you give me an opportunity today to share the gospel with someone? And it's never ceased to amaze me when I pray that. Like you know opportunities that pop up so if the Lord's stirring your heart towards this type of ministry just start praying that Lord I don't know where to get started but would you would you just give me an opportunity and give me the grace to to walk through the door and 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 seize that opportunity but as churches I think um, you can help support these um, ministries um, financially you can help um, by just by helping raise awareness within your church. I know when I was on the board at the PCC, um, it, it was kind of strange, and, and we worked hard at it, but uh, there's almost a disconnect sometimes between the churches and the ministries. Like, 
you know, we need better ways to connect the information and get people involved. So um, as a church, and it may not always be easy for the pastor, but maybe there's a person here at this church with a burden for these type of ministries who could really serve as a liaison, you know, between the ministries and help you keep up to date. Because, you know, they might have this desperate need for 20 people to come pack envelopes. And, but, you know, <laughs> how to get the word out there. And, and, man, we would try to contact the churches. But, y'all, I'm just telling you, and I don't, I don't know about here, but it would be difficult to get in contact with the churches and get responses back. So um, that's, that's one area. Also, I just think, and this is to piggyback on, I could, can't remember who, who said it, but I think, you know, we, we are Bible-believing Christians, right? And the fundamental principle in operation in our lives that should be in operation in the church is what? It's grace, right? The grace of God that we have been extended. So we believe in grace, technically. We're saved by grace <laughs> through faith, right? <laughs> but many times our churches aren't really, don't possess cultures of grace where, like, it's really okay to be the person you really are, like, coming into, uh, you know, our corporate times of togetherness, whatever that looks like throughout a week for any local church, but being that kind of place where it is safe for a woman who's contemplating abortion or a family who's really struggling to, to pay their bills, to be a culture of grace where people can come and find help. I mean, this ought to be a great, you know, like it says in Hebrews, the throne of grace, you know, where we're warmly invited to come and find mercy and help in time of need. And man, if the church isn't a little representation of that, you know, so sometimes I think we need a reorientation of our culture becoming a culture of grace. Um, I know for, for our ministry, um, some of the ways that churches um, currently service is by um, allowing us to use their church as a venue um, so that we can have events for like foster parents night out um, can be a huge blessing to foster parents to babysit those children and let them have a night out or even a day out. We have a church in Brookfield that does a day out for them um, to have some time off um, and some respite. Some moms go shopping, some couples go out to eat, some just go home <laughs> and take a nap, which is fine. So just opening up your church um, to love on those children for a day or a night. Um, another one would be to host um, things like this. So allow different ministries to come in and share even from the pulpit on Sunday morning is really awesome <laughs> to give up a Sunday and let us come in and share what we're doing when the church is at its fullest um, and let us share what we're doing um, to keep people engaged because even though the work we, we do doesn't change from the big picture, we always have new needs popping up all the time. Um, so just to kind of express those and, and having a liaison in the church was great. I know Call to Care has several in this church, so if I need something announced or if I need it to get to you, I have people that I call but we don't have that in every church, and I'm sure they don't either. Um, sometimes I have to call them and say, who do you know at this church that will answer when I call? <laughs> you know, but having like almost like a community liaison or something that, that knows what's going on in the community um, is really wonderful. Um, another thing is hosting events for teens. Um, there are about 300 teens in our area in foster care. Um, the, num the statistics about teens in foster care are almost identical to statistics of teens who age out of orphanages in like third world countries. I mean, it's where well, they're not that much better off in America like you think they would be. Um, and not from like lack of resources because actually our government does a lot for them to help them um, as they age out of foster care. But just especially if they never were adopted, just that trauma that they've experienced leads them to make a lot of the same decisions as their parents. So we have this never ending cycle um, of people a, either aborting their children or having children in these terrible situations, um, and lots of them. Um, Called to Care is only nine years old, but the teens that were um, in our program when we started are adults now, and most of them have two, three, four, five. Some of them have six and seven children, um, and they just have like one a year, and um, their children have been taken from them. 
Um, and so just that cycle. So host and teen events are really important for us for churches to do that um, for multiple reasons. We could host an event for teens anywhere. I could call and rent a venue or get a venue donated. But getting them in the church every opportunity we can um, is such a huge blessing. Exposing them to church, exposing them to church people um, who they feel so insecure around and letting them see the love of Christ. So that's a great thing to do is for teens. Um, and you don't have to know what to do to do that. Let me just say that you can just say yes, and I can plan a party with you <laughs> or with your team of party planners at your church, and we can make that happen um, and do it very cost effectively, too, if that's the concern of churches, um, taking on something like that. I would say another really big thing that um, churches need to do is be trauma-informed. Um, there is not a church in this county that's had us, at least, to come in and train their staff on how to care for children who come from hard places. So if you did have families foster and adopt in your church, it's very likely that they would not know how to care for the children the way they should, um, and may see a lot of things as behavior when they're not really behavior, it's trauma and hurt. And um, I've seen it in my own church. I've seen kids sent to the front to sit with a nursery worker and not allowed in the room because they didn't recognize or understand how to help children who are hurting. And it just doesn't have to be children in foster care. If we're going to open up our church to broken families and single moms who are already struggling, their children are going to be hanging from these chandeliers, I'll go ahead and tell you. And we don't need people saying that child or those bad kids, which is what us church people say. Um, churches need to be trauma-informed. And I know that we offer that training. I don't know. Do y'all do any trauma-informed trainings? Or no, just in it's cost. So do y'all offer any? Well, we do. We okay, we do. Okay. Well, we we do have them, and we, they're free. We will come and train for free. So that's a great thing that every church could do is be trained. Um, and we use TBRI training, which I know that won't mean anything to a lay person, but um, it's a great training to help people to work with children um, and families too, because you can actually parent these adults the same way and meet them where their trauma is and and love them well. Um, want to ask briefly, well, I want to ask about adoption. And I'm going to give you a couple scenarios I want quick answers to, and then we'll close with one final question. So for those of you who have fostered and adopted, what is that like? What are the joys and the challenges of it? Um, I have a couple friends who have adopted, but like my image of fostering is like that old lady from Angels in the Outfield. So like, like fill us in a little bit on what that's like, because I think three of you have fostered. Is that right? Um, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. We can sign you up tomorrow to babysit children in foster care or do emergency placements. Yes. So um, in the last, I think, six months, um, close to 100 children had to be placed in hotels for at least one night because DFACS does not have enough homes. And so we desperately, I say we, I don't place children, but we desperately need people to take children for even for just one night until they can get them to a relative or the appropriate type of foster home. Is that a, Laura, is that a state or TIFF County? That's number? for the that's for our region. Our region. So 18 counties. 100 children. Right at 100 in the last six months, oh. including newborns. Newborns leave the hospital and go to a hotel. Hotel, there's, hotel rooms. Yeah, because, with a paid state worker because there's, there's just not enough homes. This is not like a, I don't know what the, I don't know what the problem is. There's just not enough foster homes. <laughs> We do take emergencies our house. That's what I was saying. Sorry. Yeah. So what's it like fostering and adopting? And, and what are the joys and struggles that come with that? Um, you fostered too, didn't you? Do you, you want me to go or you go? Or? Let's both go. I'll, <laughs> I'll go first. Um, <laughs> I'll talk to this side. You talk to that side. Um, um, my son, Caleb, is sitting back there. He's very shy, so don't look at him. <laughs> I'm going to be the bad guy for even mentioning his name, but, uh, you know, we, we have uh, five children in total. The first four are our biological children, and, and Caleb we adopted, and, and our first three daughters, they're grown now. My youngest daughter's 22, or is she 23 now? She's tw at least 22. <laughs> you, you start, you get so Somewhere many, and you there. lose count of where they're all at. Amen. But, uh, <laughs> but um... Man, our youngest daughter was nine or ten, and I was I was working, I was a sheriff's deputy here in Tiff County, 
and I was assigned to the court security division. And part of what that meant was every week I was working in the defects court. And I was also, I was a bivocational pastor. So God just started working through my heart, my wife's heart. At first, we're just like, ah, we want to adopt. But then we started exploring that a little bit. And you start hearing like the, it starts out as statistics about the lives of these children. Like a hundred kids go into hotel rooms because there aren't foster families. And you're like, why am I getting into this? You know, am I getting into this because I'd like to adopt a kid? You know, I'd like, we want to get us a kid. Or you start realizing the need. And fostering, I, 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 won't, I would never give you my experience of fostering, uh, mine and my family's, because it, it was so unique and so unusual in that it was just extremely out of the norm, easy and a blessing uh, a situation. I'll tell you this, before we fostered and then adopted Caleb, we, we fostered two little boys. We had some respite care, but we fostered these two little boys for six to nine months. It really looked like we would get to adopt them, but in the end, they went to some kind of some distant family members, and man, that broke our hearts. And it was ve- it's very difficult because you have to develop this category of being able to love this child as if they were your own, and yet they might not be. And that is a that is an unusual. Like you just need God, you need the Holy Spirit to miraculously give you this this category of sacrificial love. And if you're thinking about doing something like fostering, you know, if you need to, I, I don't know how you would do it. You, you're either in it for the wrong reasons, or I'm sure there's all kind of different reasons. But if you're a believer, you just need to go into it realizing this is going to be a labor of love. It's going to be very difficult. I'm going to need to be ready, willing, and able to love sacrificially. And, and this is going to be hard. I tell you what, we got Caleb when he was two days old, and it wasn't a situation where the, where the mother had drugs in her system when he was born, and yet we brought him into the home, and it was a rough period of time. It was a really different from all the rest of our children, and we're like, Man, are we doing this right? What's going on? Do we make the right decision? There's just all these, all these doubts and fears. But as believers, and this ties back into what I was talking about, a culture of grace. Um, being able to have that kind of heart. That y- You think about the infinite love that has been lavished on us as believers. So what I'm talking about is tapping into that source of infinite love and recognizing that we can sacrificially pour that love into the lives of other individual people. Um, God's been very kind to us. If if you're thinking about fostering now, um, I got to see so many different situations between friends I knew who did it, but also from the behind the scenes court perspective, like, I mean, you've done both. You've been Casa and, you know, the foster parent is the least important person in the whole picture. And in some ways, that's appropriate, right? Because the children come first. If they can be reunified to their parents, and that's a good thing, that's great. But you got to be willing to be put in that position where my needs, my wants, my opinions, my feelings all come last. But that's okay. Because these children need the love of Jesus. And you can be a conduit of that love. So those are just a few of the thoughts I have. If you're planning to do it, just expecting it being extremely difficult, potentially heart-wrenching. And, you know, Satan will no doubt oppose you every step of the way. Because, you know, if you're a believer and you're thinking about fostering, you're thinking about adoption, I mean, adoption... That's central to the gospel. We've been adopted. You know, so there's a, I I mean, I I have to say as believers, there's a little bit of an evangelistic element to this, right? Just like with our own children. We want to see these people grow up to know and serve, believe, and worship our Savior. So.
I'm so glad you said sacrificial love because that is my that's my line that kept me going um because there there were a lot of hard times we we did it for years and we got into fostering because my plans y'all know always know how that goes when you tell God your plans <laughs> my plans were to foster until we could somehow afford to adopt from overseas that's what I wanted to do that's what Christy wanted to do <laughs> um but and I thought well I mean, gosh, there's so many, there's such a need, you know, we'll do this and I'll get to help, not that I'm the greatest mom in the world or anything, um, but being, a, I was a stay-at-home mom for 16 years, that was what I did um, full-time, and I just thought if I could just help these moms, you know, and they could get their kids back, I mean, that I went into it with all kind of naive, rose-colored glasses, it was ridiculous looking back, but um, I'll just, I'll just share the first child that we had, who is very, very, they're all dear to my heart, but that one, I really felt like that he was our child, and I still am in contact with him. We got him at four months old with a spiral fracture in his leg, because his dad got mad, because he spit up on himself after a bath, and so broke his leg. And these were young parents, and I fell in love with the mom. I did. I loved her like she was my own. Begged her to come stay with us the whole nine yards. But um, he eventually left our house after about almost a year to go stay with an aunt who I also liked and still stay in touch with um, pretty regularly. But I remember the day he left our home, and we knew it was coming. And I'm going to tell you, when you love a child <laughs> and, you know, you've been there you know, from four months to over a year old, so you've done all the first, you know, the crawling, the eating the baby food, the walking, the turning one, and the birthday parties, and seeing all those changes and all that, and your children. We had three biological children. I can't remember their ages off the top of my head when we started, but they were pretty young, um, and they loved him. I mean completely loved him like he was their brother and I remember the day he left and I remember our youngest child Grace was probably six or seven maybe maybe I'm not sure anyway she was young and she had tears just falling down her face she's like why why mama why and I looked at her and my other two and I and I thought thank you God for this moment even though my heart is broken and I mean, just, I can't even tell you, but I said, this reason we're doing this and the reason we'll do it again is because of sacrificial love. I literally said that that day. And I said, what did Jesus give up when he came here? He went from having everything and being everything to absolutely nothing to, a, you know, a baby in a manger you know, where animals ate out of. I mean, how much lowly can you get? And then he ultimately, you know, died on the cross and suffered and defeated sin for all of us. So who am I to say my heart is more important than this child, than this child having a safe and stable home, even if it's just for a little while? I pray every day, I pray that that sweet baby boy that we gave him some sort of foundation. I know he's not going to remember us. I hope I get to see him in heaven one day or hopefully before that. But I hope he remembers the love. And you know what? Even knowing how it was going to end, I would do it over a thousand times. In fact, we went on to do it about 20 more times. <laughs> but we, we didn't have another one that long without adopting. But we did have several for several months. I was the stay-at-home mom, so I got all the preemies and the newborn drug addicted babies that screamed all hours of the night and day and that's why we need respite families because when you haven't slept for like five years in a row you really need a good night's sleep but um I say all that to say I would never tell anybody to be a foster parent everybody needs a foster parent no everybody does not need to be a foster parent um 
and, and it doesn't make me some kind of or person ever. I just was willing. I was called. We were called, and we were willing. I kind of dragged my husband, but he 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 got along with it. That happens most of the time, right? Um, but the sacrificial love. I told my children, this is why, and I really think they got it. I really believe. And how else can I teach them that? I mean, I'm sure there's other ways, but how much more real can it get? That the hardships that my children, my biological children, our biological children went through as a result of us fostering, the reward of that far outweighed any kind of, you know, the heartache, the sharing mama and daddy, and maybe not getting to do this or that and the other because we had traumatized children in tow they sacrificed a lot and um i think it has i pray it has taught them the love of christ i would say like on that um you know some people say like well why would you expose your children to that i sure see people said that to you and even with us just doing respite and having kids i mean the most i've had is like 10 days so not that long but my children are the same way i mean i sing the same nursery rhymes i sing my children you know i use the same bubble bath i keep some in the cabinet that I bathed my babies with. But I mean, as parents, and I'll say this to people that have young children, um, you are raising defenders of the gospel, hopefully, and you're raising kingdom builders. And what better way than this display really, like Matt said, I mean, it's the gospel right there in your living room floor um, and raising up your children that when things are hard, when people are struggling, you walk in, you don't walk out, you don't close your eyes and plug your ears and say, la, 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 like it's not going on. Um, that we are called as believers to embrace people who are hurting um, because our goal is ultimately, obviously, we don't want children in foster care. We do not want children in orphanages because we also advocate for all the children who are in orphanages waiting to be adopted. But our ultimate goal is not just to get them out of foster care, not just to get them out of these orphanages, but to get them into the kingdom. Um, That's why we are here. Um, So we just encourage people to pray about foster and adopting Um, especially if you're empty nesters and think you would like a teenager. A lot of teens, they will not place in a home with younger children because of some of the trauma they've experienced. Um, We have a teen mentor program, and y'all, these kids are incredible. Um, I mean, they are incredible and very easy to love, so just want to encourage empty nesters, too, if you think you'd like to start over. I mean, they're teenagers, so they're, like, almost out, so it's not, like, really starting over. (laughs) But we, we need that as well. Um, I said I had more questions. I think that's a perfect note to end on, and it is past seven. Um, and so um, I, I hope this has been helpful to you. I've got a lot to think about. I hope you do as well. Um, I'm going to pray for us. And actually, if, if you um, didn't know, we're having a finger food dinner down the hill in the fellowship hall. Um, you're invited to that. Come eat and fellowship with us. Um, it's the building down the hill, the one that isn't connected to this. Um, and so, so head down there. And, um, and feel free to get a plate and eat. I'm going to bless the food now, and you're um, dismissed and free to go. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for the sacrificial love of Jesus. I thank you that he laid down his life for us. And, Lord, we can never fully repay such a thing. But, Lord, we can, uh, we can reflect that love to the world like the, like the moon reflects the light of the sun. So, Lord, help us to do that. Um, Lord, I pray for our hearts. I pray for my own heart and for those... Um, who have heard tonight, and Lord, I pray that you will um, help us to figure out what our thing is and and, and to do it. Um, Lord, may we not simply be pro-life in our heart, may we be pro-life with our actions in ways that actually impacts people, um, in whatever way that is. Um, And and Lord, may may that itself um, cause the gospel to take a deeper seed in our heart and transform us. Lord, I pray for this issue. Um, the battle is far from over with Roe versus Wade being overturned. And so I pray we will take up our mantle and, and work faithfully until Jesus comes. And Lord, we pray that that would be soon. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Um, we pray all of this in his name. Amen.